This is the Celtic Soul podcast, and this is a bonus podcast. It's from our Celtic AM pre-match show, Celtic v Falkirk, with Eddie Toner, Rudy Vata, David Potter, and friends. Hello, folks. You're all very welcome to Celtic AM. This is a virtual one, because like so many of you, I'm in lockdown. I'm in a 5K zone. I have been for a couple of months. I'm missing Glasgow shocking, and it's been a year, well, it's actually been over a year, since we sat in Malone's, eating bacon rolls, drinking pints, listening to a few tunes, and talking Celtic. Now, if you've been to Celtic AM before, you'll know the score. But if you haven't, here's a little introduction. Celtic AM started in 2016. A handful of people turned up the first morning in Malone's, and I think it was Jeanette Finney was the first guest. John Fallon was there. Average Joe Miller was there. I can't remember the fourth guest on the day. But it grew from there on. We've done most three o'clock Saturday, Sunday games. Um, and we had a couple of crackers. The day before the Rangers game, we had one on the roof garden, or the beer garden, a Jimmy Johnson special. And his wife Agnes stole the show with stories of Jimmy off the park. There were stories of false teeth and going missing. and everything, and George McCluskey and the Jimmy Johnson Academy boys and a few others filled us in on Jimmy's great, great contribution to Celtic. And, you know, I'm sure there was a few tears that day, but there was most of them were tears of joy listening about the great man. And then we never thought when we started off that we would get invited to do it somewhere else. We got invited to Philadelphia, thanks to the player boys. And we had a brilliant time over there. One of my favourite ones was when the association, the Irish Supporters Association, invited us to City West, yeah, City West, before one of the big dinners. And I got the chance to interview Danny McGray in that day. And that was, that was brilliant to interview such a legend. And we also done one night in Bangkok and a Celtic AM in Pattaya and Thailand. So they're, they're highlights. And they're actually the last two we done. The last one in Malone's was the St. Mirren game. And, None of us knew what was going to happen to us for the past year when we left Celtic Park that day. Happy that we got a victory heading for the nine. It's been a turbulent season. We didn't win the league, but we have a chance to win the Scottish Cup and we kick off against Falkirk. So today on the show, I'll be joined by Eddie Toner. Eddie would be well known to most Celtic fans, but if you don't know Eddie, he's the former secretary of the Celtic Supporters Association he picked up the award when we got the UEFA award or the FIFA award, whatever it was, or both. We got both uh, for our behaviour in Seville. The only fans ever to get the Fair Play award. So fair play to us. Uh, so Eddie be joining me. And also joining me will be Rudy Vata. Rudy, of course, played in the 1995 Scottish Cup final. And he'll share his memories of that day, the semi-final, and indeed... Two great Celts that were involved that day, Paul McStay and manager Tommy Bones. But before then, I think we should get a history lesson on Celtic's favourite competition from the man who wrote the book on the Scottish Cup and Celtic in the Scottish Cup, Mr David Potter. The Scottish Cup is the uh, oldest trophy in the world. It's not the oldest competition the English Cup uh, was started in 1872. The Scottish Cup started in 1873, first final played in 1874. Uh, but the trophy that is in the Hamden Museum is the original trophy that was presented in 1874. And it has been presented every year to whoever wins the, the cup exclusively, more or less Celtic, in, uh, in recent years, thank heavens. Although I don't honestly know how they did it on, um, uh, this, on last December when we won the cup, as you remember, and we couldn't substitute, they couldn't substitute the trophy with a replica because you just saw the, the trophy on, uh, on the podium and Scott Brown went uh, to collect it. So um, I, I don't really know what happened with the, 
um, uh, the trophy in 2020. But uh, it, normally what happens is it is presented to the winning captain. Uh, the winning captain then disappears downstairs, gives it uh, an attendant who puts it back into the museum, and then it is um, uh, give, he's given a replica. And the replica is used to be you know, shown to people and taken to the stadium and whatnot. But the, the, the original trophy is meant to stay in the Hamden Museum simply because it is too old and it is too fragile. However, it started in 1874 and Celtic managed to get the final in their first year of existence. In 1889, they were defeated by Third Lanark. Uh, after a game which they, uh, which were, well, the first game was abandoned because of snow, and then Third, Lan Third Lanark won the replay, and Celtic eventually won the cup in 1892, and significantly they beat Queen's Park in the final. Now that is important for several reasons because Queen's Park were the middle class establishment uh, team of Scotland, of Glasgow, and Celtic, of course, were the forerunners of professionalism, but also the team that represented uh, the Irish immigrants. And the fact that Celtic won the Scottish Cup and they emphasise the word Scottish Cup is very, very significant in my view because, of course, it emphasises the fact that we are the Irish immigrants, but we're now Scottish and we've now conquered Scotland, uh, as it were. And it was for the same reason, of course, that they were very keen uh, to build uh, the huge stadium at Celtic Park so that it could house the Scotland versus England games, as they did in 1896. Uh, 1898 and 1900. So um, the, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, nuances of history in that. Uh, they won the cup in 1892, two goals from Sandy McMahon, two from uh, Johnny Campbell and an own goal. They won it again in 1899, 1900. And then in 1904, we come to the great uh, Jimmy Quinn Cup final. Now, there have been several great Scottish Cup finals and this one, I think, was probably one of the best because Celtic were 2-0 down early in the game to Rangers at the New Hamden Park, the New Hamden Park, which had just been opened the previous uh, October. And uh, uh, Rangers were 2-0 up, uh, but Jimmy Quinn pulled two back, equaled Cel brought Celtic back on equal terms by half time, And then in the second half, uh, he went on to score the winner. And uh, it was a great occasion for that. And uh, that was the one which immortalised uh, Jimmy Quinn. 1907, 1908, 1911, 1912, they also won the Scottish Cup. And then we come to 1914. Now, 1914 is a very significant year in world history, as we know. In the history of the Scottish Cup, of course, it was between Celtic and Hibs in 1914, referred to quite openly as the Irish Cup final. Apparently, before the game in the first Cup final, the whole crowd sang, God save Ireland, cry your heroes, and so on. Well, I don't know the words myself, but uh, that first game ended in a rather disappointing 0-0 uh, draw. Hibs, in fact, really should have won it. Uh, but on the Thursday night, the Thursday night of the replay, Celtic just quite simply took over. It was one of Patsy Gallagher's best ever games, and uh, Johnny Browning scored two, Sniper McCall scored another two, and it was 4-1 for Celtic at full time. And uh, newspaper reports tell us about the march back, as they called it, how the supporters uh, got themselves into a crowd and just marched back with their banners, singing their songs all the way back from the west end of Glasgow to the east end of Glasgow. What a sight that must have been. And uh, it was just as well, of course, that nobody knew what was going to be uh, coming along in August of 1914. But the point was, of course, as well, that in 1914, uh, uh, Irish home rule was very much a political football in 1914. Uh, it was, uh, well, we know what happened in 1916 because uh, home rule wasn't granted in 1914. And uh, it was um, very much, uh, but don't anybody try and tell me that uh, sport and politics don't or shouldn't mix. They are very much uh, involved with each other, in my view. 
However, once the war was over, Celtic won the Scottish Cup again in 1923, a goal by Joe Cassidy, also against Hibs. And then in 1925, we come to the great game which involved Patsy Gallagher. Now, uh, 1-0 down to Dundee late in the game. Dundee's goal scored, incidentally, by David McLean. David McLean, who had played for Celtic in, uh, in 1908 and 1909, and whom I once met, but that's another story. And uh, then Patsy Gallagher scored his equaliser. Now, uh, contemporary accounts all say that Patsy got the ball wedged between his legs, somersaulted back into the net, and that was how he scored. Some people thought that should be a foul for obstruction. I hope not. I don't think so. Uh, my father, funnily enough, who was at that game, uh, always said about that particular goal that he didn't see clearly what happened. He just saw uh, Patsy Gallagher being disentangled from the back of the net by the Dundee players and uh, the Celtic players. He did, however, my father did have a very, very clear view of the winning goal in 1925, which was scored by who else but Jimmy McGrory. It was a free kick taken by Gene McFarlane, who uh, uh, famously pulled up his stockings uh, before he took the, uh, the free kick, sent over a lovely, uh, a lovely lob, a lovely lob. And my father remembers seeing that there was a line of defenders as a line of defenders and a line of Celtic players, and he just saw one person with a green-white uh, leaning forwards at where from the line and scoring the goal. And he always said a green and white figure catapulted forth to score the goal, which won the cup for Celtic. And that was, I think, the uh, 11th time that Celtic won the Scottish Cup. Fast forward to 1931, and we find another great Jimmy McGrory occasion. This time, down 2-0 to the very, very good Motherwell side. And this time, they really did look down and out. But uh, I think it was Charlie Napier this time uh, took a free kick, and McGrory was able to score off the, uh, the, the, uh, the free kick. And then, with uh, the, the, the time almost up, and uh, as everybody was looking at the big clock on the Hamden uh, stand and everybody was saying, uh, well, 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 it could have been well, well, well for well, well, well. But at that point, uh, Bertie Thompson on the right wing uh, beat a man and crossed the ball. And Jimmy McGrory went up for it. Jimmy McGrory actually missed it, but it hit the head of Alan Craig. Motherwell centre half and was deflected into the goal for an own goal. And my father recalled the time, uh, many, many years later, he would recall it, of how Craig lay on the ground, thumping the ground because he'd given away the goal. It almost goes without saying that the replay was won 4 2 by Celtic. Celtic won again in 1933, 1937, and then. Uh, the, from 1937 to 1951, which was a long time, although the Second World War got in, in the way right enough, uh, it was a long time to go without winning the Scottish Cup, but it was John McPhail who uh, scored the goal in 1951. He also won it in 1954. And then we come to the first Scottish Cup final that I can honestly say that I remember. This was 1965. Once again, a classic Celtic Scottish Cup final. Uh, one nil down, Bertie Auld equalised. A ball from Charlie Gallagher hit the bar, went way up in the air, came down, Bertie Auld, 1-1. One, one. Then Ferman scored again just before half time. Not long after half time, a fine move between Auld and Lennox, and Lennox, uh, uh, Lennox passed to Auld, Auld scored 2-2. Two, two. For a long time, it looked as if it was going to be a replay. John Fallon had one brilliant save from Alex Edwards. And uh, then nine minutes to go, Lennox took the corner kick, sent the corner kick across, up goes Billy McNeil and heads Celtic to glory. Again, the funny thing is that I have no 
clear recollection of that goal. I was away on the other terracing, away at the gangway number 24 or 25, I forget which one it was, uh, but uh, I didn't see clearly. And I remember thinking that it might have been Gemmel who scored, who had the same colour of hair from a distance as Billy McNeil. But I do remember my father saying, Billy McNeil, Billy McNeil, Billy McNeil. And of course, the remaining nine minutes were uh, nothing short of agony as we waited for referee Hugh Phillips to blow the final whistle. Because, of course, it had been the first time, uh, the first time that Celtic had won the Scottish Cup since 1954, which was 11 years ago. And these 11 years had been pretty horrendous. We had lost a cup final to Clyde. We had lost one to Hearts. We'd lost one to Dunfermline, to Jock Steen's Dunfermline. And we'd lost one to Rangers in 1963. These 11 years were not good ones for Celtic in the Scottish Cup. And then, of course, things change. 1967, Willie Wallace scored two. 1969, Celtic four, Rangers nil. Very, very famous uh, um, uh, victory in its own right. 1971, Celtic two, uh, Rangers one after a replay. And then 1972, we come to Dixie Deans' hat-trick. Now, Dixie Deans uh, scored the hat-trick that day, putting him in the same bracket as Jimmy Quinn. And frankly, you can't say any more than that. If somebody's compared with Jimmy Quinn, well, uh, that sort of settles it all. Um, I remember talking to Dixie about it, and I said to him something about you're in the same bracket as Jimmy Quinn, and he says, aye, but I did it twice. I scored a hat-trick twice in a cup final. Well, technically he's correct, but the other one was actually a League Cup final. But still, not taking anything away from Dixie. Uh, it was a it was a great time. Uh, it was a great day, great day for Dixie, uh, and a great day, day that was. Celtic beating Hibs uh, six two. Games against Hibs in the uh, early seventies and the late sixties were usually great games, full of loads of goals, and usually Celtic won. And uh, we won it also in 1974-75. In 1977, Andy Lynch's penalty. Some of you remember Andy Lynch's penalty. 1980, uh, it was George McCluskey who scored, and that was the day of the... the rather disgraceful. And then one of my favourites is also 1985. The Scott final of 1985, when again will it down 1-0 to a very stuffy Dundee team who were managed, of course, by Jim McLean, who had laid the emphasis very much on grim defending, and they were good at it. But then we got a free kick from uh, David Proven and a wonderful header from Frank McGarth. Three years later, we did the same. It was McAvenny who scored. 1989, we had uh, Joe Miller. And then in 1995, it was Pierre Van Hoydonk who scored the one goal against Airdrie in 1995, and my, how we needed that victory. We were again on our knees in 1995. We just lost the League Cup final to Wraith Rovers, of all people, some six months previously, and we were on our knees. And from then on, of course, the Scottish Cup uh, and Celtic uh, we're back on speaking terms. The uh, remaining 10 that they won between 1995 and 2020, I'm sure most of you uh, will remember them. Of these ones, um, I think my favourite would have to be um, 2017, because uh, I do remember the, very much the goal that uh, Tom Rogic scored. Uh, uh, apparently, there was a thunderstorm going on in the ground and outside the ground at that time, and nobody really noticed. But I'm told by those who were around that there was a thunderstorm actually happening, uh, and that was a great one. Uh, now, 2007, incidentally, that was the time when the goal that won the cup was scored by the very unlikely person called Jean Joel Perrier Dumbe. It was against Inferman. It was, frankly, a dreadful game of football. Dreadful game of football. And uh, uh, I was glad that scored, obviously, and it, they did win the Cup. But I think Dunfermline got relegated that year. And you saw why Dunfermline got relegated that year. But Celtic weren't really an awful lot better. Uh, and another of my favourites in uh, recent uh, 
uh, years is, of course, 2018, where the weather was lovely. And funnily enough, it was the same day as the royal wedding. Yes, the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle was held on that day. Now, fancy people like us deciding to go to a Scottish Cup final instead of w watching the royal wedding. Um, <laughs> And uh, with two lovely goals, scored two very similar goals actually were scored by Callum McGregor and Olivier and Cham. And of course, 2020, well, that was a tight afternoon. That was a, a tight afternoon. I'm a, a, a part of me was a, just a wee bit sorry for hearts that day. Um, me being sorry for hearts doesn't happen very often, I would have to say, but I thought they fought back very well, and I honestly thought Celtic were going to blow it. But anyway, that is the, the, the Scottish Cup. Uh, 40 times we've won the Scottish Cup. Uh, Rangers won it 33 times. Uh, after that, third in the list of Scottish Cup winners. Not a lot of people could guess this one, but it was actually Queen's Park who come third with 10 victories. Queen's Park winning in the 1870s and 1880s. After that, I think it's Hearts with eight, and they're not going to win it this year, and Aberdeen with seven. Everybody else, uh, you know, there's the occasional, um, I think, uh, uh, what's good about the Scottish Cup and the Scottish League Cup, I think, is it, it gives uh, other teams the chance to win something. The chances of either Celtic or Rangers uh, not winning the Scottish League are actually, I'll rephrase that. Um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if Celtic don't win the Scottish League, we know who will. Whereas in the Scottish Cup and the Scottish League Cup, there's always a chance that somebody else could do it, like, for example, St Johnston this year. And there's always that chance that uh, uh, this could happen in the Scottish Cup of 2021. And I am really looking forward to seeing how the Scottish Cup will develop. I will be very disappointed if Celtic don't win uh, their 41st Scottish Cup. And from what I saw of the game on Sunday... Uh, between Celtic and Rangers at Parkhead, I think Celtic were the uh, better team on Sunday, and I think that Celtic on their day are still a better team than Rangers. So I am still fairly confident about the Scottish Cup on May the twenty second. David Pardo, historian, Celtic fan, Pardo. What can I say? Absolutely brilliant, folks. Check out his book, Scottish Cup, Celtic's favourite trophy. You get it on Amazon, Celtic Bookstore, Celtic Superstore, whatever. If you if you enjoyed his little introduction there into the Scottish Cup, you're going to love the book. I've read it. It's brilliant. and I, I know a lot more with the Scottish Cup now than I did. David's wrote, I think, 40 books, maybe over 30 on Celtic. So I think he knows a little bit. Uh, David's been on the podcast as well. So he's done two episodes with us. So if you check out the podcast on CelticFansing.com, it's also available across all platforms if you want to hear more from David. He also does a weekend column, The Long Read, in the fanzine, where he normally picks a player and does a good long read, so it's a nice cup of coffee or a point, especially in lockdown times. Um, he's also in the fanzine every month, and while I'm talking about the fanzine, I'll do a little promotion. Issue 114, we've been going for 20 years, and you can buy that as well on CelticFanzine.com, or you can subscribe. It's the only thing you have to pay for. It's that subscription. It's free to subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's free to subscribe to the podcast. And it's free. All the articles are free on the website. And so if you want to support us, you can buy the fans in, subscribe, or buy a T-shirt, or a bit of a merchandise there on the shop. So thanks very much for that. And thanks very much for all the support over the past 12 months, because it's been tough without ground sales to keep the print edition going. Digital edition, we can keep going. Don't have, the, don't have the cost to print. Anyone, anyone that's involved in print knows how expensive it's got. But we couldn't do it without you and the sponsors and the patrons and the supporters clubs. So thanks very much. And talking about supporters clubs, we got talking to a few of our friends who we've often bumped into Malone's. But because this is virtual and I've got a head like something from a Doctor Who episode, we've asked a few of them to give us their favourite Scottish Cup moments. So here goes. Hi, my name's Stephen McLeish. I'm from Broomhouse in Glasgow. I go to the Johnny Gallagher Celtic Supporters Club from the Celtic Club in London Road. 
A favourite Scottish Cup moment, I never thought I would say anything was better than the McAvenny centenary final, but I've got to say Tom Rogic against Aberdeen had me sitting in my seat greeting like a big baby, so that's the one. Hail, hail. How you doing? This is Charles Levin of the Pat Levin, Cock number one, Sexy Supporters Club, 1988. The oldest and the original club in Cock City. The Scottish Cup finals for me bring back a lot of memories, two in particular. One would have been my first one in 1989 against the other mob, where Joe Miller scored a cracking goal in a beautiful sunny day. But my most favourite would have been the 2004 Scottish Cup final, when the team had most of my favourite players. Henrik Larsson scored a double, Stanley Petrov scored one. Also on that team on that day would have been Alan Thompson, Neil Lennon, Chris Sutton, just to name a few. What a day. Scottish Cup finals are really special to us. Name is Mark McCabe from Finglas, uh, living in Glasgow, member of St Margaret's CSC, the league and all over the world. Very, very proud member. Um, Favourite Scottish Cup moment has to be big Tom Rogic against Aberdeen at Hamden. Last minute winner. Absolutely sensational. And can't wait to get back to them days. Keep safe. God bless. Bye-bye. My name's Jeanette Finlay. I live in Glasgow and I'm a member of the Denison number one uh, Celtic Supporters Club. I have a huge number of really good uh, Scottish Cup final memories, but probably my best ones are for when I was very much younger. And we used to always end up in the Cladder Club on the south side after the games, where we would sort of um, horrify all the very nicely dressed elderly people by our terrible dancing, but it was great and I loved it. Hello, Tony Rutten here in Sunderland. Uh, Sunderland's Celtic Supporters Club. Cup memories, so many. Uh, but Hibs, when we beat them 3-0, to clinch the treble. Martin O'Neill's first season stands out. How you doing? I'm Kieran Davenport. Uh, for many years I've travelled on the Loman CSC bus and from Dumbarton. I now travel games independently as I've moved away. My favourite Scottish Cup moment would have to be 1995 with Hoydonk scoring that header against the Adrianians. It's the first proper Cup final I remember us winning uh, and it's just always stuck in my head. A close second would be Rogic against Aberdeen as well as it was just a uh, unreal. Gus McDonald here. Um, formerly of uh, <laughs> Cool Foot William, now living in Brada. Travelling uh, uh, for the games anyway we got to get to. With the St. Margaret Celtic Supporters Club, I used to be with the Fort William number one. My favourite um, Scottish Cup moment was actually there's two. Uh, it was the late winner in the centenary, uh, just amazing in the, the old Celtic end of Hamden. Uh, and uh, also at Hamden, showing Maggie Fatcher the red card. Money Hoops. My name's Paddy McManaman. I grew up in Belfast. I lived in Donegal for many years and now domiciled in Galway. In over 50 years travelling, I've never been a member of a supporters club. My first memory is the cup final of 71, when we beat Rangers 2-1 at Hamden in front of 100,000. A young Lou McCary scored first, and then a Harry Hood penalty sealed the victory. Afterwards, we were attacked by angry bears going up Mount Florida, but it didn't stop the celebrations that night. Another great memory is the Centenary Cup final in 88. Uh, when in front of Maggie and 80,000, we defeated and de United 2-1 with two goals from Magavani in the last couple of minutes. Both great memories of the Scottish Cup. John Mooney here, Port Lauderdale Emeralds. Uh, my favourite Scottish Cup moment has to be that day in Hamden in the sun, rain and sleet, with Tam Rogic creating the bit of history to start out the invincible season. How's it going, folks? Paul Murphy, Hinchcar Emerald, CSA. Need a haircut. Favourite Scottish Cup moment has to be the Centenary Cup final, 1988. McAvenny's late winner. And then to crown it all, the Iron Maiden, that old bitch, had to present the trophy to Roy Aiken. That's it. Slant. Hello, Rene Hansen here. I'm a member of Erin O'Bra Belfast. It's very hard to pick a memory from the Scottish Cup, but I will say for me, it's uh, Tom Rogic's winning goal in the 92nd minutes against Aberdeen 2016. Hail, hail. Hi, my name is Tommy Conlon from St. Catherine Celtic Supporters Club in Canada. And my favorite Scottish Cup moment is Frank McAvaney's winner in the 88th centenary season in the Cup final. Special goal and a very special season. 
My name is Erin, I am from Glasgow and my favourite Scottish Cup memory has to be back in 2017, 2-1 Aberdeen, rounding off our invincible season with our first of many trebles. Rogic's last minute winner and a bounce in Hamden will forever live in our memories. Tom Rogic's goal, still fresh in the memory. What a day. I wasn't at the 88 Cup final, but if I could climb into a time machine, that would be the one I'd go back to. The celebrations must have been brilliant. I would have been 16 years of age. It was the following February when I went to see Celtic Forest. And um, what a night it must have been in the Garbles and the Gallagher. Oh, I would have loved it. 16 years of age, full of cider, having a crack. Oh, what a way... What a way to spend your teenage years all celebrating Celtic. Centenary double and sending Maggie Tadger packing down the road. Well done, boys. And well done to everyone for sharing their memories. Thanks very much. Uh, brought back some great memories. And indeed, my next guest will also bring back some great memories. It's, I'm delighted to have Eddie Tona joining me for a chat. But before I talk to Eddie, I'm going to slip into a little black number. So enjoy the interview. Eddie, welcome to Celtic AM virtual reality, I suppose. Um, <laughs> it's been over a year since we had a Celtic AM in Glasgow and over a year since we had won. The last one we done was in Pattaya in Thailand. So uh, that, was a, that was a bit different with a bit of heat that yeah, day. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so, with a great reaction to you on the podcast. Um, there were some, some great stories. You know, you never know when, when, you, when you do a podcast where the stories are going to lead to. But it was coming up to the Scottish Cup and we were a bit nervous, you know, to do the quadruple treble. Yeah. And you were going out to get your new outfit for the Cup final to sit at home and watch it. And I, I seen your tweets that morning, Eddie, you were a bit frustrated and not being able to go to Hamden. Yeah. It's, it's a special day. It's a special competition. And we kick off now against Farrell Carrick. Now, there's been shocks before. We've been beaten by Clyde. So, you know, but wouldn't it be great to go on a run? Give us something to cheer about in this kind of lockdown reality that we're in. And also, what a way for Scott Brown to be sent off if we can go on a run in this competition. Yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, I mean, everything's got to be geared towards that, but that's all we've got left for this season. You know, I've said it before, nobody's seen this coming, the disaster the season's been so far and. We do, we do have a bit of an opportunity to try and redress the balance in some way by by winning the Scottish Cup, and and I think it would be quite poignant, you know, maybe an, an added incentive now with the with the captain deciding to move on to pastures new. What better way to, to send them off, as you say, than to you know second most successful Celtic captain ever lifting the Scottish Cup for the for the fifth year in a row? It, it would be a really fitting tribute. I remember fondly Big Billy's last game for Celtic in the 1975 Cup final against Airdrie. Uh, now we didn't know before the match that Billy was ready to, to quit at that time, but but it certainly added a certain poignancy and significance to that that game. So uh, let's hope we can go on a run and get to the final and uh, uh, and, and give Bruni the send off he deserves. But you know, ultimately that will be down to him and. And some of his colleagues on the pitch who have maybe let us down this season as well. So uh, we've done everything we can do as fans. There's no doubts about that. It's been frustrating this season. Uh, there's been a whole... Well, who knows what went wrong? I'm sure there'll be a story to be told. Uh, but, you know, really, ultimately, it's down to Bruni and, and, and the guys in the park. They certainly have the ability, the ability to get us there. Uh, Maybe this will give some of the players a wee bit added incentive as well, and then maybe get a finger out and and deliver us a wee bit of success and something to look forward to for next season. And the big question is, uh, if we were to get to that final, would there be a new outfit? Oh, absolutely! There's a new outfit for every cup final. I mean, it's it's a long-standing tradition. Uh, you know, I, I do think the Scottish Cup. It's very, very special. It's a real significance for me as a Celtic fan and probably for, for thousands of others as well. I mean, you know, I go back to... I was taken to my first cup final in 1969 as a six-year-old kid by my uncle. Uh, and we beat Rangers 4 nothing that day. So what, 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 what a baptism for Scottish Cup finals. Uh, 
and I was brought up in an era then from then right through to 1975. We were in the cup final every year. So I was six right through to I was 12. We just seemed to be in the cup final every year. And won it most years as well. You know, there was the exception of, well, with the Aberdeen hiccup in 1970. And I think that other mob beat us with a fluke down for size goal in 1973. And they beat us 3-2. But other than that, we said, just seem to win the Scottish Cup or get to the Scottish Cup final every year when I was a kid. And that was my formative years. That's what really drew me into Celtic, you know, and the magic of it and stuff like that. So the Scottish Cup finals always has a real significance uh, to me. And, and I was always aware there was a special sort of, a, you know, that feeling of a special occasion round about it. You know, even as a kid going to the game and people would do the Scottish Cup final rosette, the old-fashioned rosette on and uh, with the colours on it and the date and the year of the Cup final with a wee sort of a silver cup in the middle and stuff like that. So it just always stood out for me. Uh, so in later life, when we started to reach the finals again uh, regularly, I, you know, I always made a real effort, as I suppose many folk did, to make sure I went out and I bought something obviously green or something green and white. Uh, and, I, and I just always liked to turn up in cup final days with a new shirt or a new outfit or whether it be green shoes or green jeans or a green something. Yeah. It did culminate one year in the making almost a bit of a bit of a titty myself. The nineteen ninety five cup final obviously slap banging the worst decade uh, of, our, of our history in terms of success. Uh, and we got to the cup final and I was saying, what what do you do for this cup final then? It is special. It's going to hopefully deliver Tommy Burns his first trophy as manager and uh, and just the week before it, uh, a friend of mine's dad, Jackie Stewart, who sadly passed away recently, people will be well, Jackie was a well-known uh, character amongst the Celtic support. He was the MC in the Celtic clubs in Springburn and in the London Road for a while. He was a bit of a singer. Uh, he quite often hosted the sing song and lunches on a Sunday afternoon. He, I mean, if you YouTube them, you'll see him on the video singing the Willie Mayley songs and stuff like that, Jackie. But sadly, he passed away just just fairly recently there. But he 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 was the father of a very good friend of mine for Easter House, uh, Davey. Uh, and in 1995 at the time, they used to run a competition in the match day programmes at Celtic Park where they would take a picture of the crowd, the crowd scene, and they would circle somebody in the crowd. And if you ever circled, you won the new kit, the full Celtic kit. Uh, so Jackie, uh, Jackie got circled in the crowd and he'd seen this picture and said, oh, you've won a strip, Jackie, you know, you've won the whole... And Jackie being Jackie, if anybody knows him, he's a bit, he could be a bit grumpy at times. Oh, what am I going to do with a strip? I would rather just have the readies, have the cash. You know, a strip's no good to a man of my age. I says, I'm going to collect it and I'll buy the strip off you. And what are you going to do with it? Me this time, I'm in my 30s, you know, 35 and... Uh, I said, I'll wear it to the cup final. <laughs> and he went, you know what? I said, I'll wear it to the cup final. So Jackie went and collected his prize, and I think I gave him a tenner for the full cat. So it was a bargain. <laughs> and uh, But I was uh, I was sort of a sort of a forced at that point, and he falling through with the commitment. So I turned up that day on the supporters bus with the, the full kit on, the, the shirt, the, the shorts, and the... <laughs> In the socks, and off. I know. I know. There's a name for that now. The youngest call them full kit something. Ah, oh, no, yeah, like that's what I wasn't going to lower myself in this esteemed podcast. He's saying words like that, but but, <laughs> but I turned up that day with a full kit on, uh, and it was a great laugh. I remember being in this early end when, uh, when obviously Big Pierre scored the winner and gone mad, and people doing a bit were having a lunch. You know, there was loads of kids with the strips on, and there was this 30, 32 year old. Old father of two, you know. The, well, father of one at that time. The wee man, the second boy, wasn't he? He was only born in '96. Uh, jumping about with a with a Celtic strip on in it. There is a bit of footage. I don't know if you remember the, the, the Celtic video of that year, uh, where Tommy brought the bus down through the gorbals and up through the Gallagher and stuff like that. And there's a bit of footage on it briefly, as you see him coming up the Gallagher past. The old original Wee Man's pub, which is now demolished in the gallery. And you see us all rushing out to meet the bus. And there was me like a sort of a return Bobby Murdoch decked out in the full kit, you know. So so that was my outfit for that day, uh, for the 1995 Cup final. 
But since then, <laughs> but since then, as I say, every time we get there, we go. And, and, and Jeanette joins in as well. She gets herself a new outfit as well. So we like to get, it's never shirt, suit and shirt and tie or anything like that. You know, it's always a nice new casual or, yeah. but aye, it's, it is a bit just, it sets aside that day. It just adds something else to it, you know, as a special day. And I, I just have fond memories of the Scottish Cup. I just loved it. it. It's a lovely tradition. Um, we have we have Rudy on the, on the show today. And I I did say to Rudy um, about, I'd seen footage, you know, going up the Gallagher, up yeah. by the wee man's. Yeah. And then we spoke about when um, he arrived, when they arrived back at Celtic Park and Tommy Bones. A very special, um, like Tommy had won everything as a player, a very successful player. I love, you know, everyone, like everyone knows Tommy's story. And I did say to Rudy, I says, it must have felt very special for Tommy to come back as a manager at a time when we hadn't won anything in six years. And, it, but really was just, he just, you know, you'll hear it yourself when we chat to him. It, it, when he spoke about, when he spoke about, um, both Tommy and Paul McStay. Yeah. He just yeah. couldn't say enough good about them. And it like it was great that day for McStay to sign off for a trophy. That was his last trophy, his yeah. medal, you yeah. know. Absolutely. For being so loyal to us. And for and Tommy coming back. It, it, it was quite romantic. Oh, absolutely. And you know, a real significance there again, they're two guys who's who were steeped in Celtic, you know, you know. The McStay, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that Willie's still got a role at Parkhead. I just think there should always be a role for the McStays at Celtic Park. Uh, and for Tommy, Tommy's just Tommy. Tommy's everybody's hero, and quite rightly so. And, I mean, the real significance of that day, you know, in terms of success for the club, you know, and, you know, Fergus McCann wasn't along in the door, and it set the ball rolling. It still took us another couple of years before we get a real head of steam up, I think. Uh, but it certainly set the ball rolling, and it made you, you know, made you think again, well, the good times are not far. We've suffered a lot, but the good times are not far off. Uh, and, that, and that was true. But what I really remember about that weekend was that journey in the bus. You know, that would only have ever happened under Tommy Burns. I don't believe that Tommy made the decision. You know, the, the fans have been starved. They're a success. Let's enjoy it. You know, and, and they chose a deliberate route because normally the bus would have just headed straight back over to Celtic Park, over the back of Ruggland and up into Parkhead. But... No, he brought the bus down through the Gorbals and by the Brazen Head and, uh, and up the Salt Market, past places like the Tollbooth and into the Gallagate and stuff like that, because he knew that's where we would be. He knew that's where the Celtic community congregated and celebrated. And, and it was fantastic because we hadn't enjoyed success for years. Uh, and aye, for me, that was just a measure of the man as well. It was, again, as a wee thing back and a, and a nod to the fans for, for standing by them. And, you know... Aye, sadly for Tommy, he wasn't to be around that long, you know, in, in terms of being the manager and stuff like that. It could have all been different had he been maybe supported a bit more with Fergus and the board at the time. But uh, but no, just two great men, you know. For very bad that he mentioned that doesn't surprise me because they're just two absolute legends when it comes to Celtic. Yeah, and, and it, was, it was a tense final. What was that as a classic? Oh. It was a tense final, but I was like... Phil O'Donnell com- comes off the bench in, in the replay in the semis. Do you remember that game? Do you remember much about that game? The semi final, the. the but there's the semi final, Motherwell? No, uh, we played Hibs twice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. At Ibrox? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, because yeah. it's really that gives the ball into Phil O'Donnell. Yes, and, that's uh, right. Like, that was kind of a 2 1, you're still an edge. Yeah. And then a 3 1. Oh, absolutely. You know, like comfortable, yeah. Eddie. You know, in the cup final as well, you know, I think we went there again with no expectation that we were going to cruise it, although we were playing Airdrie, you know, and normally you play in Airdrie and you think, you know, this is easy, but it, but it wasn't, it was a tough game that day and, uh, you know, it took a spectacular cross for, for Tosh McKinley and uh, and Big Pierre to get on the end of it, you know, and, uh, but that was a team that was full of great Celtic men. You think about Tosh, Tosh was a great Celtic man, you had Paul McStay, you know, you feel a Donald coming through and, uh, you know, Tommy, Paul McStay, Peter Grant, you know, was it? Peter Grant had a decent game that day as well, maybe one of his best for us. Uh, uh, but, it was, but it was a tough, you know, you were only, it was only when the whistle went, it was at that, that side of relief, you know, that we'd actually done it and got over the line, you know, and it was, uh, it was a lot of Guinness drunk in the Gallagher that night, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for definite. 
Eddie, um, <laughs> Peter Grant says after that game that, um, that that was that was better than than the centenary double because it, it just seemed to be it just seemed to be a coming and get it coming together after all the frustrations of getting rid of the old board, the new yeah. the new board coming in, you know, stadium to be built, you know, the, the new stadium. And then, you know, we kicked down from then. And yeah, the, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. I mean, that's what I was saying earlier. But, you know, that there was a sense that we were reborn, if you like. You know, the, the stadium was starting to take shape. Uh, you know, we were, you know, guys like Van Hoydong and then, you know, subsequently that year, Andy Tom and the Canio and stuff. You know, and there was a real sense of anticipation and excitement. As I said, it took us another couple of years before we would actually win the title back again. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, for that into the 2000s, and we really kicked on. Uh, and it's been an unprecedented run of success since then, really, for us, you know, in terms of domination in the domestic game. But, uh, but no, I, I, 95 for me was a, you know, it was a significant thing. You know, we had come through the dark days and we'd come through the boycotts and the, the divisions amongst the fans, the divisions at the club, uh, you know, there was a sadness when the when the old stadium was being torn down for many years, you know, and the demand, the loss of the jungle, you know, all that sort of stuff. But uh, but also a real sense of anticipation, I think. Uh, and I think that cup final was maybe the catalyst for it. So I, but Scottish Cup finals are like that, aren't they? You know, they are. They're, they're significant milestones in the club, you know. And I, again, it, you know, adds to the sort of a specialness of the occasion of the cup final. Yeah. yeah, you look through that team, like I think we. Like, in Packy, Rudy, Big Pierre, the rest of the boys, you know, the rest of the boys were born in Scotland. Or, yeah. You know, there yeah. or thereabouts. Maybe one yeah. or two not. But I, if I can just picture that team, um, I know, I know uh, it was the Troy Colour for Packy. Because I remember, I remember looking at a team on the seventh wiki or so. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. But do you think, you know, with this current squad, we're going into the cup now. Hopefully, be Falkirk. Hopefully, go on a run. Eh? <laughs> do you think it does? Because we, we have good players. They just don't. Yeah. They just didn't play. Do you think that you know, with this brand of, we'll say, player and those boys back in '95, where you kind of, you know, it was it was sleeves rolled up. It was you know, let's do a job here. Whereas, you know, the boys are so used to success. You know. The, the, they don't seem as hungry. There may well be an element of that, but but surely God, I've any you know, I've any of them sat and watched or endured the sort of a amount of celebrations and over the top stuff that we've had to endure in this city in the last couple of weeks. It's been shocking. Uh, you know, you'd like to think that some of that's got through them, and there would be you know some sort of a professional pride in in, in, in a sense. Of, you know, we owe our support something. We need to put this right. We need to give them something to celebrate. And, and, and you know, and if that's no an incentive enough for them, then, you know, don't let the arse hit you in the door on the way out would be my <laughs> phrase, you know. It's, uh, it, you know, it's been tough here the last few weeks. Uh, you know, if you speak to anybody in Glasgow, it's been, you know, well, we've probably let more fireworks off in this city than there was in Hong Kong or Sydney Harbour at the New Year, you know, but uh, it's it's been, you know, there's been tons of sectarian graffiti around the city. There's been, you know, it's not even just been a good celebration for that or so. Or, you know, it's been that level of triumphalism that you would always expect from them. And, and you know, you know, there's been, you know, flagpole, you know, lamp posts around and draped out and flags and stuff like that. And uh, it's not been pretty. And, and I would like to think some of the players have at least get a sense of some of that and thought, you know, you know, we need to redress the balance a bit here, you know, enough's enough in terms of having this shoved down my throat, you know, but do they have the hunger for it? Only time will tell. I mean, the fact that we're sitting here saying hopefully we'll beat Falkirk is an indication of how far we've fallen in the last, in the last year now. I have no doubt we have a squad of players that are more than capable of brushing anybody aside, but is it about desire? Is it about hungry? Is it about, you know, personal ambition? Yeah. I think the big fact that we had in 95 was Tommy Burns. Uh, and the local guys certainly knowing the significance of Tommy and Paul McStay and wanting to play for him. Uh, 
But at the very least, these guys should be playing for themselves in their own professional pride. And it may well be that some of them are, I would think quite a few of them will be moving on to pastures new. Surely they would want to get the door on a high and no one to be remembered for the team that went through one and four trebles in a row to one and nothing. You know? Yeah, yeah. Eddie, um, yeah, see, we're so detached over here. You know, it's different for the boys that live up north. They've had, you know, they will have yeah. in Belfast, they will have that triumphalism. They will they will see Raiders fans celebrate. We don't, you know, if, even before lockdown, yeah. I've always said before, in the building that I, I, I have the office, there's only one other Rangers fan in the whole building. And yeah. thankfully he, he they've moved to a different office now. <laughs> but, um, because I, I used to give them pelters. <laughs> but, and, and I would have deserved to get it back. But yeah, so it, 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 I, I know exactly where I come from. I see an average job putting on Twitter a bit of fireworks and that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Joe's, oh, always, Joe, Joe's always humorous with his tweets, which is. Which is yeah. Let, let you take it. I, 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 I can take and understand the level of, you know, celebration and excitement, you know, at winning. They haven't won anything for years. They've suffered that. By God, they've suffered it at our hands primarily over the years, you know. So they're entitled to go and enjoy that and celebrate that. But some of it's went away over the top, you know, and, and some of it needn't rain in. And, uh, you know, with our game, I don't want to get too political because this is a fun pro, you know, a fun program about, you know, you know, looking forward to what we may achieve in the Scottish Cup. But I think quite a bit of it where, you know, when where the establishment have turned a blind eye to some of it as well when you know, seem to be different rules, you know. You know, an organised match for Ibrox to George Square to allow them to celebrate, you know, compared to, you know, the day we won the treble treble and what, what the Celtic fans were meant to be at the top of the salt market in, in, in Glasgow Cross that day was a line of police with batons drawn and told to go home, you know, basically. Uh, and that wasn't during the pandemic. Uh, that was the police ready to have a go. Uh, you, know, a, you know, a legitimate celebration, waiting in an organised you know, basically an organised tour for the, with, with the winning bus coming up that route. Now, it did, you know, the crowds that gathered, there might have been some concerns about public safety and it maybe it had to be dispersed in some way, but, you know, the fact that we were met with batons drawn and the police ready to wade in as opposed to, you know, coppers doing dances and taking selfies and march name all the way through the city in the middle of a pandemic into the centre of the city and allowing them there five or six hours and, t- and then putting out a statement saying, you know, it was policed appropriately and within the terms of what they believe to be people's human rights and all that. It's a load of bollocks. <laughs> it's, uh, well, that is what it is. You know, we've, you know, we've been suffering that for years. And, well, and I don't I, think it's finished, sadly, because, you know, they'll have their trophy day and they'll have their flag day. And, you know, so we may have a bit more to put up with. But, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully uh, we, we, we will have... Plenty to celebrate in the future as well. And before I let you go, you, you've climbed into my time machine. I've never climbed into it because all my podcast guests <laughs> climb into my time machine. But uh, I have, if I if I could get into the time machine, I would go back to the 88 Cup Fund, which, ah, which was, it was probably the first year I started just, you know, showing interest in Celtic. I didn't. I didn't get over the Glasgow until the February of '89. Just briefly take us back to that. Ah, oh, incredible! You know, the, both the semi-final and the final of the Scottish Cup that year were just incredible. You know, because we had the two late goals against Hearts in the semi-final when we thought we were down and out, and. I think it was Henry Smith that was in goals for Hearts and dropped the ball and gave us a bit of a lifeline in the semi, and then we got we stole a winner then. And then to get to the final and win it in the way we did, you know, the 88 final was very reminiscent of the 85 final against Dundee United as well, when we got, you know, went a goal behind and then there was a fantastic David Proven free kick and Frank McGarvey, what a flying header uh, winner. But the centenary season, again, it was, it was almost as if it was meant to be. Scorching, glorious scorching day. You and we always we always went to the North Stand in those days in Hamden. You know the big sort of a uncovered terrace, the North, sorry, the North enclosure. The North Stand had gone by then, and you know sort of just. And we always more or less picked for sport. You went in early and got you know a good picture of sport and 
cracking blazing hot day, you know, just then there was a sense of excitement, anticipation, and then, you know, when I went and go went and it just there was nothing to beat it, you know, it, you know, it was just magical, uh, absolute bedlam, you know, and it was almost as if it was just it was deemed that we were going to win the double that year, uh, you know, especially we, we've got a great history, uh, you know, in landmark years pulling the goods out of the bag. So, uh, no, it was fantastic. Uh, probably one of my favourite cup finals, almost trumped by the Tom Rogic goal uh, in the Invincible season as well. You know, that, that, that you know, if you'd asked me all my favourite cup finals in the past, it would, it would have been 85. Well, the 72 cup final against Hibs when we beat them 6-1 and Dixie Dean's got a hat trick was one that always stood out for me as a young kid. I just... That blew me away, that performance. And uh, But then up until then, the 88 Cup final was probably always my favourite. And it probably sticks out still as my favourite. But it was nearly uh, usurped by the, the the Aberdeen one. You know, there was a real significance with the Aberdeen one. We'd been there with all the family, you know, and, the, you know, securing the treble again and and the invincible stuff and just the way we win it. something special about last minute winners and cup finals, isn't there? So, Unbelievable. I, 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 I mean, I'd, if you could go back and you had your time machine, I would certainly, I would have no qualms in buying a ticket and going back with you that, that day. That's oh, yeah, you could, you, could take, <laughs> you could take me around the Gallagher after the game. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have been 16, so I may not have gone into something. <laughs> that oh, you're happy to go, yeah, no bother. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'd just like to leave the viewers. With this, with this uh, thought in the head, Eddie Towner, full hit wanker, outside the, <laughs> outside the women's, cheering on Tommy Bones and really bad that Paul McStay and all the boys on the bus. It's on the video. Home. If you go, if, if you get if, if, if you get the video and forensically stop it at that point, you'll see some sort of a fairly returned lunatic jumping up and down and it's brief do you really need to look for a bit it's, it's, it's there <laughs> and Eddie when you were on the podcast you spoke about how you would still love to be a ball boy but come oh. on you shouldn't be dressing like that <laughs> well Eddie, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not making any I'm not making any I'm not making any promises but you know I would have, I would, have, I would have thought those days would go but I'm quite happy to go for a nice sort of you know, it's a day green, the new green shirt for every cup final. You know, I don't think I'll go okay, back to those if, days. if we win the cup final this year, right, we'll do a sponsorship for, we'll buy you a kit for the Cana Foundation. And, you know, you, <laughs> you could, that would be a picture. And he thanks a minute, he's been brilliant as always, and hopefully we'll get you on again. This it's is a pleasure. Our, this is our pilot virtual show, but hopefully, the, hopefully we will get you live sometime. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview. He's cracker Eddie, isn't he? Some great stories and, you know, born in the shadow of Celtic Park. And I tell you, check out Eddie's podcast if you haven't. It's absolutely brilliant. I look forward to Eddie pulling up in the black cab and picking me up in Glasgow Airport and dropping me off the Arthur Hotel when we get back to normal service in Glasgow. And Celtic will get back to normal service and the new coal will be pushed off the perch so they can enjoy it. Enjoy the fireworks as Eddie spoke about, but next year we'll bring the fireworks and the bang back. But I think from that interview with Eddie, I think the one thing that will stick in my memory is Eddie in his tutties, outside the Weemans, as the Celtic team bus went by, dressed as a full kit wanker. Eddie, it must have been some sight. That uh, must have been some sorry. Anyway, thanks Eddie for joining us. And my next guest, and I will slip back into my little black number again for him. I want to look well for Rudy. Is Rudy Vata. 1995 Scottish Cup. Let's hear his memories. Hello, Rudy. You're very welcome to, I suppose, a virtual Celtic AM. We're normally in Malone's for these shows, but because of lockdown, we're still restricted to our own little areas. How have you been? Yes, hello, Andrew. Been very well, thank you. Everything has been good. We stay safe and healthy, and that's the main thing so far. And we're looking forward to the future because hopefully we get the freedom back soon and then we get to do the normal things. Yeah, the vaccine should be a game changer for us. 
And talking about game changers, really, we're doing a bit of a Scottish Cup uh, episode today because of we kick off against Falkirk in a season where we won't win the league. Now, you won the Scottish Cup. Celtic hadn't won a, a trophy in six years. They hadn't won the league that year. But on the 27th of May, 1995, Paul McStay lifted the cup. You played in that game. What are your memories? Great memories. As, as you say, the team was very hungry for a trophy. We had been going through difficult spells for so many seasons. We were without any trophy in, the, in our cabinet of trophies. So that trophy meant a lot, I think, to the club, to the manager, Tommy Burns. And of course, in my personal point of view, was a great achievement. Yeah, and, and, and a great way to, I suppose... We'd, we'd had a couple of barren years. We had the Rate Rovers Cup, League Cup final. And then we go, well, uh, Big Pierre uh, scored the goal, but he had to come off early. And it was, it was Willie Falcon that came off. But one thing, like Pierre scored a couple of goals in that run. Willie scored a couple of goals. John Scott, Collins scored a penalty against Kilmarnock. And in the semi finals, uh, Phil O'Donnell scored the third goal when he came off the bench and it was you that gave in a perfect ball to him. Yeah, I remember that. We played at Ibrox. We, we we played Hebs twice in the semi-first game, finished nothing each, I think. And then the second game, we dominated the game and Phil came on and I had was in my area where I had to take the free kick and I delivered a very good cross. And he had it a fantastic, um, he scored a fantastic goal with the header. The timing and the delivery and, and the execution, I think, was, was perfect. And was one of, the, one of the best games I had under Celtic jersey, that semi-final, the Scottish Cup in 1995 against Hebs. So that, that game, it's, it's also a game that uh, I will not forget so easy because... I played with a lot of, I had a lot of energy and I was hungry and I really wanted to, to be in that final. So I am glad they, I achieved that. Yeah, and if I look at, if I look at our, our route to the final that, that year, we beat St. Mirren 2 0, Meadowbank Tissel 3 0, Kilmarnock 1 0. We had the 0 0 draw with Hibbs. We beat them 3 1 in the replay. But in that replay, that was the only goal we conceded. So a solid defence, Rudy, that you played in. Yeah, it's true. Solid defence. We were getting better and better all the time. The shape, the shape of the team was much better. And uh, we, we were started to, to, to believe in ourselves. And Tom, Tommy Burns, he brought in his philosophy of football. And uh, the things are, were, were getting better and better. And as I say, the... We were hungry and we were determined to to get to that uh, cup final and win the win that trophy because it meant a lot to to everybody. So that's the main thing is the hunger and uh, when you are so close and when you play for Celtic, I'm sure that you want to win the trophy because it's something that uh, you have forever. Yeah, and. You mentioned Tommy Bones there, the late great Tommy Bones, and indeed Phil O'Donnell um, has, has since passed away since that that cup run. In, in the dressing room after the Hibs game, like what was it like? Was it was the great celebrations that you know we, we were getting Fantastic. back to the final? Fantastic celebration! We were there, and we still had a lot to do, but uh, we were in the final. We learned by the mistake. We we done against three throwovers in the League Cup final. So I think um, even the final maybe was not the best of the games, but we we did put in a professional performance. And most important thing at this point was to win the trophy. And Pierre scored a very good goal. It was a fantastic cross delivery from Tosh McKinley, I believe, in the left back. And Pierre he he. He took he took his chance and he scored a fantastic header. And uh, those moments they they are stuck with you in your memory and uh, and that's a beauty about football and those results 
gives you a platform for the next step and helps you a lot in your personal self-confidence and self-belief and everything so it's uh, it's it's been a great se great season for me and for Celtic also I believe uh, was a season that when uh, things are start were starting to pick up and and looking forward everybody was looking forward to a brighter future and uh, and that was that 1995 cup final and that trophy I think was the turning point for better things it certainly was, and obviously you heralded in um, Fergus McCann and a new stadium. We stopped the 10 in a row after that then, and then we kicked on. You know, over the last 20 years, we've had huge success. It hasn't been the dream season we expected this year, but there is a chance for a, for a silverware this year with this team. This team is, although they're not foreign and all cylinders, when you look through the team, these players are well capable of winning a Scottish Cup. 100%. I believe they are capable of winning the Scottish Cup. And I believe they, in the last two derby games against Rangers, they showed that they performed in a very good uh, manner. And I think they have enough top players in the team to, to win that trophy. You know, we've Celtic won so many trophies for the past uh, Prior to this season, we won everything. You know, last four seasons we won every trophy that was available in Scottish football. You know, and uh, and this season now it seems a bit strange because uh, we used to win and we used to get the trophies and the atmosphere has been brilliant. But life, like everything in life, I believe that. So what goes up sometimes has to come down but again it's it's a learning curve and I am sure that this season was a big season for everybody and uh, we missed that opportunity to get 10 in a row I don't know if that will happen will ever happen again in, in, in football but that was a big occasion big opportunity for for the team and for the players and for the fans was was a big big thing and i'm sure the fans they they are they've been disappointed because they were looking forward uh, for 10 in a row everybody was looking forward and with the way the team performed last season i think we we had enough in our in our in our players and coaching staff to win but i don't know what i went what went wrong i don't know but again uh, what's going is going. We need to look forward to the future. The club still as big as ever. Uh, the trophies are there, but the club and the fans are hungry for more trophies. And with the, the Scottish Cup available there, I think it's it's time to, to kind of start their engine. Everybody needs to, to think hard and to make sure we get the trophy at Celtic Park at the end of May. And what a what a way for Scott Brown to sign off on an amazing career and an amazing medal hall at Celtic. Yeah, Scott Brown is he's done everything for Celtic. He won everything with Celtic, and uh, of course, it's he wants he wants to to leave Parkhead with that trophy in with that medal in his neck, and I'm sure uh, he's a proud guy. And everybody should appreciate what he's done for, for the club and what he's done in his football career. And he's been a loyal guy to, to the club. Great cop and great example. And it's time to go. And uh, yeah, we need to, to thank him very much. And a big, uh, a big, big thank from everybody. And, and for me as well, he was he was an example, and uh, I don't know how we're going to replace him. But uh, as I say, that's life. Sometimes everything comes to an end, and we need to build up for the future. Yeah, a born leader, Scott Brown, and you had a a great leader in Paul McStay, and indeed the Scottish Cup would be his last piece of silverware as Celtic captain. Can you tell us just sure. a little bit, Paul, and and. Sure. Can you any memories of Paul that, that that day after the game? But you know, Paul Paul was was a, he was totally Celtic because Paul's family was Celtic. 
totally connected to Celtic. Paul Paul was the was the face of Celtic in my opinion. You know, he was a great example, a fantastic player, great is uh, great leader in the dressing room, outside, everywhere, off the park. You know, he was he was. He was an example to be to be taken, not just in Scottish football. In my opinion, in in those days there were not too many too many captains with the personality that Paul McStay had. You know, he was he was a guy I have a lot of respect. I learned a lot from him, and he showed by his own example in every training session he was at his best, and he. I, I haven't seen, I played in so many countries, but I haven't seen so many professional football players like Paul McStay, you know. And above all, he was he was a gentleman and very well educated guy and a great father and everything. A great example to young players. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent he was a great example to young players. And there's he one was, sorry, really, one more uh just when I look back on footage of that Scottish Cup final, um, the team bus going up through the Gallagher and up by the wee man's bar and up to the stadium and all the fans. And when Tommy gets off the bus, you know, a fan grabs him and he, he's kissing his head. And Tommy was, you know, Tommy was like Paul. He, he, was, he was Celtic through and through. And it must yeah. have meant such a great deal for him, you know, to come back to the club as manager after being a player and he had a lot of success as a player but that you know he must have thought this is this is my greatest moment to give this day and celebration to the fans i think Tom, tommy was people's man you know he he was also again was a fantastic combination tommy and paul they played together they achieved things together they had good and bad times together they were friends and again was 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 a fantastic atmosphere, fantastic feeling. You can imagine the way Tommy Burns was feeling winning the trophy as a manager of Celtic. Of course, he achieved a lot of things as a player, but winning it as, was a real thing. It was a real, real thing. It was pure, and and you 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 experience that, and that as I say, it's, it remains with you forever because that's where you see the real Celtic. The real feeling, the real, the real Celtic life and Celtic family. Yeah, with the Scottish Cup now kicking off, as I said, we've we've a long way to go. Falkirk first, and then hopefully we, we you know we'll get that win, and there'll be no big shock for us in the cup. But it's it's been great to talk, Rudy. Um, hopefully we'll speak again as we go on this uh, cup run. Hopefully, and what a way to end this season um, for all of us sitting at home, maybe watching Celtic lift another cup. So as I said, really, thank you very much for your time and chatting to us. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. You take care. Thank you very much to Rudy for joining us. That's only a snippet of Rudy Vata's life. I've been lucky enough to interview loads and loads of Celtic players. I, I kicked off the first interview I ever done was with Tommy Gemmell in the back of a shop in Yuri back in 2001 and since then as I said I've been lucky to interview so many Billy McNeil Charlie Gallagher Danny McGrain and I know I'm name dropping but I have I've been so lucky started off interviewing for the fanzine then Celtic AM and now the podcast and it's 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 great to get an insight but of all the people I've interviewed Rudy Vata's story is the most unique. Political asylum from communism to Dublin to meeting Liam Brady to speak in Italian to him which was taught by a priest who had spent his whole life in prison for being a Catholic priest in communist Albania to as I said, Liam Brady in the dressing room to Celtic and then his career after Celtic that took him all around Europe and now he's back at home in Glasgow pally with the Albanian president who he went to school with. Unbelievable story. 
No, from refugee to Scottish Cup winner. Unbelievable. The Rury podcast is episode, I have to have a look, 33. Do yourself a favor. Give Rudy a listen. It's absolutely brilliant. Eddie's podcast is another look, 48, and David Potter's 22 and 51. So that's four good episodes for you to listen to. Don't say I don't give you anything. So, folks, what can I say? Only thanks very much if you stayed with us. If you didn't, you missed it. You missed some good stories. But look, tell your friends, come back for the next episode. Listen to the podcast. Don't forget to buy the fanzine or a t-shirt. And we'll play out with the Fields of Atten Roy by the producer of the podcast, Ronan McQuillan, and his friends from around the globe. This was recorded for St. Patrick's Day. So take it away, Ronan. And thanks very much. Enjoy the match. Keep the faith. Stay safe. And let's get back to Glasgow as soon as possible. By a lonely prison wall I heard a young girl calling My girl, they have taken you away For you stole true valiance court So the young might see the more now the prison ship lies waiting in the bay Oh, I the fields of Bath and Rye Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the way dreams and songs to sing it's so lonely round the fields of Athen Rye by a lonely prison wall I heard a young man calling nothing matters there Against the fallen and the crown I rebelled, they cut me down Now Now you you must raise our child with dignity No, the fields of wrath and right Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of Mountain Rye By a lonely harbour wall She watched the last star falling As the prison ship sail out against the sky For she lived in hope and prayed For her love in Bodney Bay It's so lonely round the fields of Athen Rye Oh, lie the fields of Bath and Rye Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing it's so lonely round the fields of Athen Rye.
It's so lonely round the fields of Athens, right? I almost forgot, folks. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like, share, tell your friends. Give us a bit of promotion because it'll save us paying for promotion because we don't really have much money. So, subscribe, follow, whatever you have to do. I don't, I'm new to this as well, but do what you have to do. And don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you. If you've been enjoying the podcast and you like what we're doing across our independent Celtic fan media platform and you would like to support us, you can do so by becoming a member, subscribing, buying some of our merch or donating for the price of a pint. And if you have a rich uncle, you're a Celtic supporters club or a Celtic minded business and you would like to sponsor any of our stuff across the platforms, please email us at info at and you can also contact us through the website or on social media.